May 26, 1914 Translation by Sri Aurobindo On the surface is the storm. The sea is in turmoil. Waves clash and leap one on another and break with a mighty uproar. But all the time, under this water, in fury, our vast smiling expanses, peaceful and motionless. They look upon the surface agitation as an indispensable act. For matter has to be vigorously churned if it is to become capable of manifesting entirely the divine light. Behind the troubled appearance, behind the struggle and anguish of the conflict, the consciousness remains firm at its post, observing all the movements of the outer being. It intervenes only to rectify direction and position, so as not to allow the play to become too dramatic. This intervention is now firm and a little severe, now ironical, a call to order or a mockery, full always of a strong, gentle, peaceful and smiling benevolence. In the silence I beheld thy infinite and eternal beatitude. Then softly a prayer rises towards thee from what is still in the shadow and the struggle. O sweet Master, O supreme giver of illumination and purity, grant that all substance and every activity may be no more anything other than a constant manifestation of thy divine love and thy sovereign serenity. And in my heart is the song of gladness of thy sublime magnificence. May 27, 1914 in each one of the domains of the being, the consciousness must be awakened to the perfect existence, knowledge and bliss. These three worlds or modes of the divine are found in the physical reality as well as in the states of force and light and those of impersonality and infinitude of eternity. When one enters with full consciousness into the higher states to live this existence, light and bliss is easy, almost inevitable. But what is very important as well as very difficult is to awaken the being to this triple divine consciousness in the most material worlds. This is the first point. Then one must succeed in finding the center of all the divine worlds, probably in the intermediate world, whence one can unite the consciousness of these divine worlds, synthesize them and act simultaneously and with full awareness in all domains. I know that it is a very long way from these incomplete and imperfect explanations to the sublime reality which manifests thee, O Lord. Thy splendor, 
thy power and thy magnificence, thy incommensurable love are above all explanation and comment. But my intellect needs to represent things to itself at least a little schematically in order to allow the most material states of the being to enter as completely as possible into harmony with thy will. Yet it is in the deep silence of my mute and total adoration that I best understand thee. For then who can say what loves, what is loved, and what is the power of loving in itself? All three are but one in an infinite bliss. O oh, give to every one, Lord, the boon of that incomparable bliss. May 28, 1914 Thou settest in motion, Thou stirrest and churnest the innumerable elements of this world, so that from their primal darkness, their primeval chaos, they may awaken to consciousness and the full light of knowledge. And thou usest thy supreme love to churn all these elements in this way. And it is from thy infinite, unfathomable heart that these inexhaustible torrents of love spring forth. Thy heart is my dwelling place. Thy heart is the reality of my being. In thy heart I have nestled and I have become thy heart. Peace, peace upon all beings. May 29, 1914 O oh, my sweet Lord, those who are in thy head, that is to speak more intellectually, those who have identified their consciousness with the absolute consciousness, those who have become thy supreme knowledge, can no longer have any love for thee, since they are thyself. They enjoy that infinite bliss characteristic of all awareness of thy supreme essence. But the devotion of the adorer who turns with ecstasy to that which is higher and above him can no longer exist. So, to him whose mission upon earth is to manifest thy love, Thou teachest to have this pure and infinite love for all the manifested universe, the love which at first was made of adoration and admiration is transformed into a love all made of compassion and devotedness. O oh, the divine splendor of thy eternal unity, O oh, the infinite sweetness of thy beatitude, O oh, the sovereign majesty of thy knowledge, thou art the inconceivable, the marvelous one. May 31st, 1914 
When the sun set in the indrawn contemplation of the calm twilight, all my being prostrated itself before Thee, O Lord, in mute adoration and complete self-giving. Then I was the whole earth, and the whole earth prostrated itself before thee, imploring the benediction of thy illumination, the beatitude of thy love. O oh, the kneeling earth that supplicates to thee, then is ingathered in the silence of the night, waiting in both patience and anxiety for the illumination so ardently desired. If there is a sweetness in being thy divine love at work in the world, there is as great a sweetness in being the infinite aspiration which rises towards that infinite love. And to be able to change thus, to be successively, almost simultaneously, what receives and what gives, what transfigures and what is transfigured. To be identified with the painful darkness as with the all-powerful splendor and in this double identification to discover the secret of thy sovereign unity. Is this not a way of expressing, of accomplishing thy supreme will? O oh, my sweet master, my heart is a flaming chapel and thou art seated there permanently like the sublimest of idols. So it is that thy form appears to me, clothed in magnificence, in the midst of the flames consuming my heart for thee, and at the same time in my head I see thee, know thee as the inconceivable, the unknowable, the formless. And in this double perception, this double knowledge, lies the plenitude of contentment.